Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight for our webcast, Innovative Fostering, Saving More Dogs with Behavioral Challenges. I'm Jesse Collins, Education Specialist with Maddie's Fund. Our presenter tonight is Kristen Arbach. Kristen Arbach is currently the Deputy Chief Animal Services Officer at the Austin Animal Center in Austin, Texas, a national leader in no-kill animal sheltering. Previously, Kristen served as the Assistant Director at the Fairfax County Animal Shelter in Virginia, where she helped overturn pit bull adoption restrictions, doubled the adoptions, and cut euthanasia in half, bringing Fairfax County to no kill. During her tenure, she implemented dog playgroups, a comprehensive in-shelter enrichment program, and life-saving foster programs. Kristen regularly presents and writes on subjects such as breed labeling, reducing foster intake, innovative foster care, and social media. She is giving a fantastic presentation for all of us tonight, so get ready. Before we talk, start, let's talk about a few housekeeping items. Please take a look at the left side of your screen, where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you can ask questions throughout the presentation. There is a certificate of attendance for attending this live event, which you can access in the resource widget at the bottom of the page. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click the Help widget at the bottom of your screen. This presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours should you wish to view it again. If you are interested in this program or in implementing this program, please put your contact information in the Q&A box. Kristen, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody, and thank you all for attending. Um, Really excited to be here tonight talking about a little study that we did in my time in Fairfax County, Virginia. This study started out as a way to just sort of track what happened when we started to try to save more lives of adult dogs, uh, adult, medium, and large dogs that had some common behavioral challenges in the shelter. And we really just wanted to track the data to see what would happen and to follow these dogs through foster and adoption. And so it's really exciting that this study has now, um, it started, it was first presented at the um, National Council on Pet Population and the Society for Animal Welfare Administrators um, 2015 Research Symposium. Um, and we had a half an hour to talk about it. And since then, it's been presented at various regional and national conferences, most recently at Best Friends. Um, and it's been written about by the ASPCA, the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association, um, it's been featured in Bark Post, and it's forthcoming in uh, Best Friends Magazine. So this study, this little tiny study we did has already reached thousands, so it's really exciting to be here tonight talking about it. Um, this presentation has two parts. We're going to talk about the study that we did in Fairfax, um, saving dogs with behavioral challenges. And in the second part, I'm going to tell you how you can start the, a similar program at your shelter. If you are a rescue or a, an animal shelter person who is more interested in cats, this, everything I'm going to talk about tonight is totally relevant to also saving more lives of cats in your shelter. Um, just a little bit about me. I'm in, here in Austin now, but I actually started my career in animal welfare um, in the late 1990s in a shelter in Ohio, and I remember the experience um, as one that to determine what dogs would live or die, um, someone would walk through the kennels every day, and they would look at the dog in the cage, and some of you will remember these times, um, and for some of you this may still be reality. You would look at the dog, and if it would growl or give what some people call a hard stare, um, that dog would get a big red E written on its cage, and at the end of the day that dog would die. Um, so just based on looking at the dog in the kennel, um, life or death determinations were made. And this was the late 1990s, and for many of us, that reality has changed, but I, needless to say, didn't last long in that environment. I left animal welfare after just a few months, went on to have a different career, and came back um, in 2013 to Fairfax County uh, when the director of the shelter, Tony Hammond, who's now the director here in Austin, um, promised me that I could uh, work to save lives rather than um, end them. So that's how we um, got, that's how I got to Fairfax County. Um, this story that I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell through the eyes or through the stories of the dogs that were involved. And this story, like many, starts with a tragedy, a dog named Carmela. And she's the one, um, you can see her on the left. She's the one, she kind of has her mouth open and is looking 
great at us. That's the only picture um, we have of her. But she was a dog that uh, shortly after I started working in Fairfax, she came into our shelter and she was friendly with people, friendly with other dogs, um, and she also resource guarded. So on the temperament test that we gave her, um, she many of you are familiar with the rubber hand that's used uh, with wet food to test for resource guarding. She, like, didn't just bite the hand, but she kind of exuberantly, like, bit it and then rolled around on the ground with it. And in hindsight, she probably thought it was a toy, um, but we saw it as resource guarding. And we had been told that, that, that she failed. You know, that was a failure of the temperament test. Um, and so we were really afraid to adopt her out. And she, we determined um, based on her, the resource guarding portion of that test, um, that we were going to euthanize her. And so um, she was euthanized. And as soon as we made that decision, um, as soon as we ended her life, the director and I felt that we had made a horrible mistake. Um, and it was sort of in that moment that we said we had to do better. Um, and we had to figure it out, and her collar still hangs on um, our director's door as a reminder um, to try to do better by the dog. Shortly after Carmela died, we uh, study, we read a study by the, that came out through the SPCA that, you know, food guarding is modifiable, and it may not appear in the home. It may be a shelter-based behavior, and so it just confirmed what we knew, that this was a great dog um, who didn't need to die. So... Fairfax, I'm going to talk a little bit about Fairfax County um, it's, it's, and the kind of shelter it was. We, it, Fairfax County is a, an open access municipal shelter and it fell under the police department in Fairfax County, Virginia, serving about 1.2 million people over 400 square miles just outside of Washington, D.C. So we bumped right up uh, against Washington, D.C. Our average annual intake was between 4,500 and 5,000 animals. And in 2015, um, the shelter achieved 90% raw live outcomes, and that's noses in, noses out uh, live outcomes. Prior to 2012, uh, the shelter was saving um, about 75%, um, but there were still things happening. There were still dogs unnecessarily dying. Uh, we were, the shelter was euthanizing for space and there were time limits for adoption. Um, so if the shelter became full or an animal was there too long and didn't get adopted, it was at risk um, to be killed in the shelter. We had pit bull adoption restrictions. So up to 80% of the pit bull dogs at any time were euthanized and the restrictions were pretty extreme. In order to adopt a pit bull dog or a dog labeled as pit bull, you had to be 25, own a home, undergo a background check, um, undergo a home visit and agree to mandatory training. So as you can imagine, um, even for the quote-unquote ambassador dogs, it was really hard to get them adopted because people could walk in and adopt um, a dog not labeled as a pit bull and take it home the same day. To adopt a dog labeled as a pit bull, it took two weeks, sometimes more, to take that dog home because of the restrictions. So um, that, those restrictions themselves ended a lot of lives. And we were euthanizing dogs for common behavioral challenges, uh, including failing the safety evaluation. And uh, Dr. Emily Weiss um, of the ASPCA was actually the first person to write about this study. Um, and Dr. Weiss has also said publicly that she didn't, she's never intended that the safety be used to call dogs to decide who should live or die, but should rather be used as a tool to gather information about the dogs. But nonetheless, at our shelter, it was being used to decide which dogs lived or died. So about 25% of all dogs were dying. Um, and if you can see on your screen, I, this is a sample outcomes list, and this is from a shelter in Maryland. But this is sort of what our outcomes list looked like. Uh, when we looked at justifications for euthanasia, it would have categories that were kind of vague, aggressive to humans or other animals, could mean many, many things. Um, another one, feral, under-socialized, or fearful. That was a category we used all of those words to justify euthanasia. Um, and we also had a category that we use quite often called unhandleable. And unhandleable just meant that no one got that animal out of the cage. So I guess we want to ask a question. Does your shelter make, or your 
community uh, make euthanasia decisions based on the results of a standardized behavioral evaluation? And the answers that you can choose from are yes, no, yes, but only as part of a comprehensive evaluation process, not applicable, or I don't know. Please answer on, directly on your screen and not in the Q&A box. And here are our answers. What do you think, Kristen? Yeah, uh, that's really interesting and um, it's really exciting to see how many no's there are uh, and how many people say yes, but only as part of a comprehensive evaluation process. I want to stop now and ask you all um, another question. So we're going to ask you, you can use the green thumbs up for yes and the red for no. Um, how many of you, if you take the dog that's sitting beside your feet right now, um, or the dog that's on your couch, or the dog that's at home waiting for you, how many of you are completely confident that that dog, your dog at home, well, if it went to a shelter tomorrow and was in a kennel for three to ten days and then was brought out for a five-minute temperament test or a ten-minute temperament test, and that how many of you are confident that your dog at home would make it out of that shelter alive if its temperament was judged on that evaluation after it had been in a kennel three to ten days? This is a question that I often ask when I do this presentation when we first start, and we find the vast majority of people, just like we're, just like I'm starting to see here, we've got 120 of you are saying no, and 36 are saying yes. 67% of you are saying you are not confident that your pet at home would make it out of the shelter alive based on this. And this was a, um, this has been confirmed um, through. Uh, a recent study um, by Gary Petronic and Janice Bradley, some of you may be familiar with this, that it, it, it may be true that canine behavior evaluations in animal shelters are no more predictive than simply flipping a coin. And so what we ended up saying in Fairfax was that we had to do, we had to do something else beyond an evaluation to determine uh, life or death outcomes for our dogs. So what did our numbers look like? Okay, beginning in 2013, we made some really significant changes, and this is where our story really begins. We stopped euthanizing for space or time limit, so dogs had as long as they needed to find a home, whether it was three weeks or three months or even longer. And we worked towards ending euthanasia based on perceived breed. It actually took us a year um, to overturn the breed restrictions um, for pit bull adopters but we did work on ending that right away. And we stopped euthanizing any dogs for failing a standardized behavior evaluation. So we just used that as a piece of, a, of information, as Dr. Weiss intended, to help us gather more information about the dogs. And we be, began implementing enrichment, playgroups, and an adult foster program. So as you can see, um, between 2012 and, and 2015, there was a significant increase in dog adoptions. And corresponding with that, we saw a significant decrease in euthanasia of dogs. Uh, beginning in, in 2012, we started to decrease the number of dogs that were being euthanized. Most significantly is this picture here. You can see how devastating those restrictions on uh, pit bull adoption were. Even in 2013, despite our best efforts at marketing and changing the way that we talk about pit bull dogs or dogs identified as pit bulls, we still were only able to adopt about 46. And then the numbers went way up, um, 2014 and 2015. In 2015, we were actually um, the first open access shelter uh, in our part of the country to pull dogs from other shelters. So we pulled, we started pulling in dogs identified as pit bulls. Uh, from Prince George's County, and many of you are probably familiar with Prince George's. They have a full ban on, on pit bulls, so they have to leave the county in order to live. So we started actually pulling those dogs into our program, which made our numbers um, of dogs labeled as pit bulls adopted even higher. When I look at this chart, I'm both happy but also profoundly sad because 
you can see in the white blank space the number of lives that were needlessly lost. We knew at the time when we were saving more lives, and if we go back to this chart of the adoption, as we were doing that, as we were saving particularly more medium and large dogs, that we also needed to be tracking our data and, and finding out what was going on with those dogs. And so that was part of the, the, the reason for the study. In addition to the foster program, which we're going to talk about in just a minute, we also started a number of other enrichment programs. We started a field trip power hour fostering. We just let any of our volunteers and fosters take any of our dogs, any of our available dogs, out of the shelter, even if it was just for an hour, whether it was to get ice cream like this dog you see here, or it was to go for a car ride or a trip to the park. We also started weekend and overnight fostering. We were closed two days a week, and it was so maddening to see the dogs sitting there. And some of you know this feeling, your shelter is closed, no one can come and adopt them. We just started sending all the dogs to foster homes, um, whether it was for one night or the whole weekend. And those dogs came back, and time and time again, they were so much more adoptable upon their return. So every weekend, those dogs would leave until they got adopted. We started kennel enrichment, um, doing stuffed Kongs and all kinds of different things. Cheerio parties are my personal favorite. Um, and we started off-site dog walking, led by volunteers. We, had, we let our volunteers start taking... Um, helping other volunteers take dogs on walks just to get them out of the shelter more. And we also started group field trips. Uh, one of our favorites was we would take the dogs to a horse cross country course that is Northern Virginia and just let them all jump the fences um, and take great pictures and then get those dogs adopted. Another program that um, sh must be specifically mentioned is that we implemented Amy Sadler's Dog Playing for Life Shelter Dog Play Group in our shelter. We use play groups to assess and evaluate dogs and also just for daily exercise and enrichment. Um, and this program really formed the foundation to be able to send dogs to foster. It looks like we've reached our next poll question. And the question is, which of the following programs are currently happening at your shelter? Select all that apply. Play groups field trips or short-term outings with fosters or volunteers, overnights with foster families, daily kennel enrichment, or daily kennel breaks. Please answer the question directly on your screen and not in the Q&A box. And here are our answers, Kristen. Wow, this is pretty cool, everybody. 44% um, are doing playgroups. I hope that uh, I hope Amy Sadler is, is tuned in tonight. I think she'd be really, really excited to see that. I'll be sure to share that with her. 39% field trip, great. Short-term outings, that's amazing. Um, I remember when we started that, people were like, you can't let the dogs leave the shelter for an hour. So that's really cool. Uh, overnight says foster family, 36%. Wow, daily kennel enrichment, 56 this is great. Good work, everyone who is uh, who's implemented those programs. Okay, cool. So, despite all of this, we have shelter dog play groups. We have the kennel enrichment. We're getting the dogs out. Despite all this, there's still a group of dogs that are at risk in our shelter. And I think many. This is going to resonate with so many of you because I think this is the challenge I'm hearing over and over again. You've got dogs with some, like, pretty common behavioral challenges, right? Jumpy, mouthy, um, leash reactive, barrier reactive. You've got those dogs in your shelter. You have no specialized behavior staff, no rescue placement options. When I w remember my time in Fairfax in the several years that I was there, I think we sent one simple dog to one rescue group one time, and it came back a week later. Uh, we didn't. We simply did not have rescue placement options for any dogs with behavioral challenges, regardless of um, their breed or perceived breed. That we only, our rescues really only took um, behavioral ambassador dogs. So even common behavioral challenges were a reason that we could not send dogs to rescue. Then we would have. So the dogs would be there. They'd be sitting there. We can't put them in the, on the adoption floor. Um, and then we start to have concerns from our staff, from our volunteers, from our animal control officers saying, you know, this dog's getting worse in the shelter. It's declining. So the language around it's going, it's going kennel crazy. It's getting stressed in the kennel. It's getting worse. And the behavior starts to decline. 
where people are handling the dog, it's getting out less, the behavior is going downhill, and that uh, that circle often leads to the death of that dog. And this is still a huge unsolved puzzle for our industry because these dogs often cannot be helped in the shelter environment. That's where the study comes in. Um, we decided that we were going to try to help those dogs. This group of dogs that's at risk because of this vicious circle were the group of dogs that we decided we really wanted to try to start saving. And that's where the study comes in. Um, that's Foley. You're going to see a lot more of him, and I'm going to tell you um, a little bit about him, but that's Foley in his foster home. But really, the study itself begins with a dog named Patty. That's Patty. She's the cutest dog in the world, right? Um, she, Patty comes into our shelter, and she is just a myriad of behavioral issues. She's reactive in the kennel. She's barking at everyone and every dog that walks by. She's so stressed that her eyes were completely bloodshot, and she was trembling in her kennel. She was really hard to get in and out, um, hard to handle getting in and out of the kennel. Once she got outside, she did this thing where she would just jump up and kind of cling on to the person, the handler. She didn't use her mouth, but that can be really unsettling for someone and certainly not something that makes the dog what we think of as adoptable. So I really didn't know what to do with Patty. Um, Amy Sadler actually was at our shelter when Patty was there, and we evaluated her in playgroups, and she was um, fairly social with other dogs, although she was so stressed that she wasn't really interested in playing. And she was really jumpy and just nervous and upset. And over time, we had Patty for a couple of months, and over time her behavior just kept going downhill so much that most of the volunteers really didn't want to handle her, and she was getting out less and less. And we, it came to the point where we put her, um, her name on a euthanasia list, and one of our staff members came to us and said, I, don't, I want to take Patty out of the shelter um, just for a night. I just want to see if there's any difference in her behavior when she gets out of here. So we said, okay, okay, you can take her out of the shelter for one night. Well, Patty, okay, so she's walking out of the shelter, and she steps one paw off of the shelter's property and turns into, like, the laziest, most, like, couch potato chill dog you've ever met. It was, like, one paw out of the shelter environment. Patty goes home that night, um, and she's with the, the staff members, three dogs, and the staff member sends us a picture of Patty, like, laying on the bed with the three dogs, looking like the happiest dog in the world, looking like she looks in this picture right here. And we were really blown away. And so we, we had a volunteer who said, you know, if, if she's okay in the home, I can foster her for a little while. So we said, absolutely. Um, and sure is Patty with her best friend, the cat, in her longer-term foster home. That's that picture on the left. Uh, Patty was uh, turned out to be extremely fond of cats. And on the right, you see Patty with her mom and dad, who eventually adopted her. Um, after a little time in a foster home, she did find her forever family, and um, she is still happy and beloved in that home. We went back later and read the notes on Patty, and what we didn't know about her, somehow it had gotten lost in the notes, that actually Patty came into us after she had been locked in a hot car, and animal control had actually, our department had actually had to break her out of the hot car so that she didn't die in it. And so it made a lot of sense to us that, like, she would be very traumatized by that experience. And some of the behavior that we saw in the shelter might very well be related to what she had gone through. And it made us think that we needed to learn the stories of these dogs, and we also needed to start an actual foster program to save more of them. Because without rescue placement options, and if they weren't, couldn't be put on the adoption floor, these dogs were truly at risk of euthanasia. And that's how the study was born. Between May of 2013 to March of 2015, we took 52 medium and large shelter dogs of various breeds and types. These dogs didn't have any viable placement options because of their behavioral challenges in the shelter, and none of these dogs were severely aggressive towards people or animals. Um, they were dogs that displayed kind of common behavioral issues, which I'm going to talk about. Um, that dog right there, um, you can see her leaping over the crate. That was her uh, first day in foster, um, where she went to a uh, to one of our foster trainers, who uh, where she got to live on a farm and burn off a little energy, as you can see. 
the foster families, through the study, there were 16 foster families, and some families fostered one dog, and some fostered several over the two-year period. The foster families all had to be people that knew what they were doing. They had to know the stakes, and they had to know that the dogs that they were taking home may be particularly at risk. They knew, the fosters knew they had to communicate very honestly with us about the behaviors that they saw in the home and that some of their assessment could lead to the decision being made about that dog's uh, final outcome. So for the most part, the foster families were just regular people. Uh, some of them were self-identified as trainers. Others were not. They just wanted to help the dogs in the shelter. And they agreed to tell us everything, and they also agreed to help us um, find a doctor for the dogs they fostered. We had three very simple objectives with our study. We wanted to know, could we place medium and large dogs with behavioral challenges in foster homes and see their behavior improve? And we also wanted to know, could these same dogs, these dogs that were at risk of euthanasia, eventually be adopted into permanent homes after going to foster? And could we do all this safely? As I mentioned in the beginning, um, we were uh, our direct police department, and we had a very strong public safety mission um, that was that was very very important. And so, tracking this data was part of uh, making sure that we also fulfilled our duty to public safety. We studied numerous things about the dogs. We tracked their ages, their behavioral issues, how long they were in foster, their final outcome the reason they were euthanized if they were. Um, if they were returned, we looked at why and what was the rate of return. And we looked at any behavioral challenges their foster or adopters experienced. And we also followed the status of the dog six to 18 months after they were adopted. That sweet Jane right there that you see, um, and she was one of our longest term fosters. I'll talk more about her in a little bit too. Oh, okay, wait, no, don't look at that. I'm gonna go back one second. All right, if you had to guess, oh, if you, in, in, you're not gonna be able to answer this, but guess in your head, how, what do you think the average age of the dogs in the study was? The average age of the dogs that were at risk of euthanasia because of behavioral challenges that we sent into foster home. If you guessed two, you would be correct. The, most of the dogs in our study, 80% were three years or under, and that makes sense, right, because they're big all of a sudden and rowdy, and they're not cute puppies anymore. And so it kind of, it made a lot of sense to us that most of the dogs were three and under, and not through that um, those terrible twos, um, or the um, they, they were young, energetic dogs. These two that you see on the right here, I can't remember which one was in the foster study, but um, the person that adopted that dog um, wanted a twin for their um, labradoodle, so. These are our best friends and indistinguishable in every way, including their behavior. Okay, so what were the behavioral issues? And this is one of the first questions that comes up when we do when we talk about this. I, I will say I will be the first to say that I am not a behaviorist and I'm not a trainer. I'm an average person who loves dogs and who works in an animal shelter. And what I've found in talking about this now all over the country is that the vast majority of shelters have people like me talking, sort of like assessing and evaluating dogs. Um, and so these categories were just based on what people like me, myself and our staff, were witnessing um, from the dogs in the shelter. The most common behavior that we were identifying was fear-based aggression. These are the dogs that are in the back of the kennel, cowering, um, growling, uh, maybe giving you a, a quote-unquote hard stare. Um, or uh, what, what people used to call a whale eye, um, dogs that don't really want to be um, touched when they're in the kennel. So that was, the, that was the most common behavioral category. The second one was just generalized kennel stress, dogs that were hard to get in and out of their kennels, um, jumpy mouthy, difficult to, to leash up. In our shelter, the, um, in, in Fairfax County, the walkways um, – outside of the kennels are very, very narrow. So it really did pose, that kennel stress posed a lot of safety issues because just trying to walk the dogs um, through the kennel area and get them in and out was more challenging than it, than it needed to be because of those narrow kennel rows. Uh, the third category was barrier reactive, and this could be uh, dogs who are uh, dogs that are barrier reactive either at the gate or on the leash. 
Um, and that was a, another significant issue because of having to walk them through these narrow channels. Um, it, it made dogs that were reactive hard to show to adopters. Next one was resource guarding, followed by dogs that were dog selective. Again, I mentioned that we evaluated all the dogs in a study in playgroup, so we did know that. Um, one dog had a, um, a bite that, um, while very minor, um, was possibly intentional, so that was of concern. And another dog was um, had a prey drive that made it hard to handle. It was just one of those dogs that was just so strong and really hard to walk around the yard because it was like every squirrel and bird it was uh, lunching at. Okay, I think we're up to another poll question. Jesse. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, before we jump into our next poll question, I just wanted to remind the audience that you can submit questions throughout the presentation through your Q&A window. So now let's move on to the poll question. Which of the following behaviors may put a dog at risk of euthanasia in your shelter? Select all that apply. Fear-based aggression, kennel stress, barrier reactivity, resource guarding, dog selective, bite history, strong prey drive, not applicable, or I don't know. Please answer the question directly on your screen and not in the Q&A box. And it looks like we have our answers, Kristen. Yeah, it's really interesting that uh, that fear-based aggression is showing up as the, the 53% um, so that would put a uh, a dog at risk. Um, that's significant, um, especially because those are often the dogs that don't ever get out of their kennel. Um, and they're also the dogs that we found that by putting them in playgroups, uh, we see completely different dogs most of the time. It looks like resource guarding with 42%, followed by kennel stress and barrier reactivity. This is great information to have for everybody that's submitting these answers as we um, continue to do this presentation um, throughout the throughout the country. All right, so this brings us to a, another story um, that, that we want to share. Um, this is Buddy. Buddy came in as a stray. He exhibited kennel stress, barrier reactivity, and extremely high energy. So you know these dogs, they just come in and they're like a ball of energy. Um, he was one of those. He was in a constant state of anxiety and frustration at the shelter, and he was really difficult to handle, particularly around other dogs. Um, and so he was one of those dogs that, like, we couldn't put him on the adoption floor. He was just, like, so challenging to get in and out of the kennel. Um, we would keep him in the back, but he would not, people were not, like, excited to take him out because he was pulling and um, hard to handle. And he was a dog that really became at risk. Um, over the days, he just continued to decline and decline every day. So Buddy ended up going to a foster home with one of our fairly regular fosters. And here's what his foster had to say. Buddy was our fourth foster, and, and he became a foster failure. He came with the charm of a dog with zero manners, and we were spent. Flash forward to today, he's taken several obedience classes, Still has no manners, but now knows some pretty cool tricks, and we couldn't be happier. And that's Alyssa. She's um, she's the one holding Buddy in that picture on the right. Um, she and her partner adopted him. They were foster failures, and they love that dog so much. In fact, so much that they brought Buddy to one of our presentations on the subject where he sat at the table during the presentation um, showing off how cute and adorable he is. That's not the end of Buddy's story, though. Um, here's a couple of our favorite buddy picks. He is a great dog, um, but he's also, he has a best friend who is also adopted um, from our shelter. And more importantly, Buddy has a job now. Buddy's job is to foster puppies and teach them to be just as naughty as he is. Um, he's a great foster dad, actually. And he brings up a point, which we found over and over again, that so many of the dogs saved through this study aren't just leading lives, they're leading really meaningful lives, and Buddy's one of those dogs. He's a foster dad, he's a beloved pet, and he is his mom's very best friend. Um, so, all right. Some of the dogs also, we had some secondary behavioral issues, because not all the dogs just had one primary issue. Some of them were just 
highly, highly energetic, which surprisingly can really put a dog at risk of euthanasia in a shelter. And this is when we've talked to different shelters about this. They admit that high energy is one of the hardest things to deal with in a shelter environment because Certainly the cure for high energy is not to lock a dog in a kennel. Um, it, it just exacerbates and worsens it quite quickly. Um, four were possibly dog aggressive. We knew they were dog selective, but we were concerned about um, their level of selectivity. Two were dog selective. Um, two were had fear of uh, men. Two were just very under-socialized. Two had displayed separation anxiety um, either in their previous home um, or in the shelter, and one displayed uh, reactivity as a secondary issue. Okay, this is probably next to the live outcome. So we have 52 dogs in this study, right? And this is over a two-year period. This is probably one of the biggest surprises to people the first time that they see this. Most of the dogs weren't in foster very long, and people when when we ask the audience to guess how long do you think the dogs are in foster on average, most people will say, well, several months. Actually, 88% of the dogs were in foster 30 days or less. Most of them uh, were, were out of, more than half um, were in foster about a month or less. The dogs, this was a very adoption-focused program. So we didn't, I know so many of us have, like, sent dogs to foster and just be like, please keep it, like, until it gets adopted. This was not that program. We put them in foster, and the foster families had definite expectations around helping those dogs find permanent homes. The dogs were there for further assessment and evaluation, and they were also there to be placed. So before I go to the next slide, I want to say that of the 52 dogs, all were considered for euthanasia um, based on the lack of placement, viable placement options for the dogs. And so when we started out on this study and we started to save these dogs, we said, well, you know, we'll be happy if like 20% of these dogs get out alive. That will be a great improvement. So as we started to get the results in and we started to tabulate data after the, um, as near the end of the study period, and we figured out the actual life outcome rate, um, we were pretty amazed to find that it was above 90%. Only Five of the dogs in the study were euthanized, um, and this chart actually needs to be updated because all of the dogs, the dog that was in foster and the one that was with the rescue group, those dogs um, have also now been adopted. So we saved more than 90% of dogs that before foster, they didn't have a hope of getting out alive. And not all the dogs had to be adopted directly from the foster home. One of the other big surprises about the study for us was that 33% of the dogs were able to come back to the shelter, be put in a kennel, and be adopted directly from a kennel when previously we couldn't have put them on the adoption floor. We were able to learn enough about them, learn how to manage their behaviors, and to bring them back to the shelter. One of the things we did really often with these dogs is we would have their foster families bring them back while we were open, and then the dogs would go back home at night. Um, and that allowed the dogs to be seen on the adoption floor, but also allowed them to get out of the shelter to keep that stress level low, um, and so that when they did come back, they were much more adoptable on the floor. We also expected a higher rate of return for the dogs, um, but actually we found that that was not the case. Six of the dogs were adopted and returned prior to going to foster home. Uh, three of the dogs, 6% were sent to foster, they were adopted, they were returned because it wasn't a good bet, and then they were readopted. Two of the dogs were sent to foster, adopted, returned, and euthanized um, because of some behavior that happened um, in the home. The return rate of dogs in our study was 9.6%, and the overall return rate of adopted dogs uh, in our shelter was 13%. And part of this lower rate of return was that the fosters were really key. They were at the, the heart of getting the dogs adopted. So the fosters would meet with the families and they would do the adoption counseling. And we also knew a lot more about uh, the dogs that in this program because they were in foster. So we were more likely to have successful adoptions with these dogs than we were with our average dogs. That dog, um, I can never remember his name, 
but he was um, owned by a, a homeless gentleman, and the man uh, went to jail and couldn't keep the dog. And he was in our shelter for quite a while. He was like another like high energy, difficult to handle, really bad pulling on the leash, hard to get in and out of the kennel. He was um, sent to foster where he was one of our longest term foster dogs, but it was because he was being treated for heartworm. He was sent to a foster, uh, and he ended up getting adopted by this family. And I was, uh, right before I left Virginia, I was walking in the woods, and I ran across these two, the little boy, and he had this this big dog at the end of his leash on a loose leash, and they're walking through the woods uh, in their camo outfits. And I stopped, and I said, hey, is that, I know that dog. And he proceeded to tell me about his dog for, like, the next 15 minutes. Um, And his parents were right behind him. Um, But... It was a happy sight to see that dog in such a um, wonderful situation and wonderful family. One of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to know how do the fosters feel about their experiences. People imagine that people won't want to foster big, more challenging dogs. And one of the other most common questions we get is, like, how did you find the fosters? And I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. We, we actually met with a group of our fosters at the end of the study, and we asked them, how did you feel about your experiences? And they told us a few things. They said they felt really well-informed about the dog's issues before taking them home. Full disclosure and telling the families everything we knew about the dog was so important because we were able to help set them up for success. So they got all the medical and behavioral notes on the dogs before they took them home. The families felt they either didn't witness the behavior described to them or that they saw the behavior diminish within a week. So the behavior either went away entirely, they never saw it, or they saw it diminish. And they said sometimes new behavioral issues emerged over time. What do you think the um, most common behavioral issue they saw is? Um, If you just think about, and that, if you think what that issue might have been um, and take a guess in your head, it was actually separation anxiety. Um, more than any other issue, we saw separation. They re- the fosters reported that they saw separation anxiety uh, in the dogs when they brought them home. And the fosters felt that trainer support and someone to consult with was key. One thing that we, what we always mention when we talk about the study is that we didn't actually have any funding to do it. And so we started to find all of these people coming out. Once they found out about the program, we had multiple trainers. Um, jumping on board, asking how they can help, and we certainly took advantage of those people. I've shown you a couple pictures of them already, some of those folks, but uh, we had numerous uh, people who were self-identified, self-described as trainers, who just offered to help. So the fosters had someone they could call if they needed to, um, or they had someone to help them troubleshoot problems. That's Moki. He was one of the steady dogs, his mom, Tina. We also called our adopters six to 18 months to follow up. We asked them four questions. Okay, so any of you who work in shelters know that this is like, in general, adoption follow-up, this long after an adoption is always a a bit of a a scary moment. We sometimes send the dogs out the door like, good luck, have a good life. And so to call and follow up, um, you find out the nitty gritty about how the dog's doing in the home and if the dog is doing well in the home. Um, and so we were really committed to finding out how the dogs did long after they left our care. So we called our adopters and asked them some questions. The first question we asked them was, is this dog still in your home? And we were really excited that 96% of the respondents said, yes, the dog is still in my home. The dog on the right pillow, um, he's the one that you see looking out the door. That dog had, uh, when he was with us, he had cancer that was, we felt was likely terminal, Um, and so since going to um, his permanent home, his cancer is in remission, he's quite healthy, and his family sent us um, numerous pictures of the same pose of him looking out the door with his best friend behind him. Um, That's his favorite spot, so he's doing really well, both behaviorally and physically, medically. We also asked him, did you experience any challenges? Uh, We wanted to know, what what were they facing? and you were really surprised to find out that they were facing the same challenges that pretty much all of our adopters face. They said things like, well, barks a lot and digs and pulls too much. Needs training and will run away off leash, but so loving. Someone said, afraid of cars, wants to chase them, but scared. Another person said, sometimes he's a bit naughty and chews on things. And you can read the rest of the answers, but these are pretty mundane 
issues that people were reporting to us, it was much less exciting than we thought it would be. We also asked them, would you readopt this dog? Most, the vast majority of people said yes, of course we'd readopt this dog. A few people said no, they wouldn't. One person said no, not knowing what we know now, but we love Mindy and have no intention of giving her up. Mindy was a dog that um, ended up having um, separation anxiety and other forms of anxiety. Uh, someone said yes in a heartbeat. Someone else said no, we love her very much, but we wouldn't adopt a young dog again because of the need for exercise and training. And they didn't say a dog with behavioral challenges. They said we wouldn't adopt a young dog again. Someone said, oh, yeah, he's perfect, absolutely. And another person said, I love him now, but in the beginning I would have opted for another dog if I had known about his skin allergy. So, again, fairly common answers. And what we, we do adoption and follow-up for uh, most of our dogs, and these are the same answers that we find um, on dogs not identified as dogs having behavioral challenges. So we didn't find any variation between this group of dogs and other dogs that we do adoption and follow-up on. We also asked them, could we, is there something we could have done to offer you more support? Could we um, have made your adoption experience better? Uh, the volunteer said yes, or I'm sorry, the adopter said yes, they would have liked some basic training, some, some training opportunities after adoption. They would have appreciated training support immediately following the adoption and someone helped them troubleshoot any issues that they had. Um, and this is the same answer we get when we ask everyone this. Um, most, most adopters, when you ask them if there's a way we could have provided more support, they're going to give you a similar answer. Some other observations that came out of the study. Six of the 51 dogs were adopted by their foster family. So we had a, about a 10% rate of foster fails. And there have been studies that show that people that foster dogs with medical challenges are more likely to adopt them. And we found the same may be actually true for people who foster dogs with behavioral challenges. Um, that there is a dog, the dog that you see there is Bully. I showed you him in the beginning when I told you that he was, um, that was him in his foster home. Um, and this is Bully with his um, adoptive brother. And I'm going to tell you a little bit. I'm mentioning him, so I'm going to tell you a story about him in just a minute. Okay. The other thing is we ask foster families, what, tell us one word to describe your foster dog. Like what is one word to describe the dog is, that you foster through this program? And so you can take it another second and, and guess um, what do you think the number one word they used is. People usually, when they guess, they say things like sweetheart, lovable, um, good. The answer is actually smart. When we ask fosters, what word describes your foster dogs in this program? The word they gave us time and time again was smart or highly intelligent. And that was really striking to us that they answered that way because it, it, it makes sense that, of course, dogs that are highly intelligent, that are smart, that need stimulation, would have a harder time in the shelter, would be more likely to display some, some behavioral challenges in the shelter because they're bored and they're stressed by their experience because their brains aren't being stimulated. In most cases, the, uh, another observation is in most cases, the foster families actually met with the potential adopters. And I mentioned, I've, I mentioned this before, but we really empowered the fosters to be the ones to decide what was the best placement for the dogs in their care. They came to know the dogs really well, and so we entrusted them to make that decision for the dogs. So they would conduct visits, um, they would uh, con help conduct dog-to-dog -dog visits that the adopters had pets, and, and they were a really key part of the adoption process. We felt all along that the fosters were in a better position to make good matches, and if you go by our return data, um, that would seem to be true, that they had a lower rate of return than uh, the average dogs in our shelter. We also feel that it was really significant that there were dogs helping dogs. Play groups were so important to this program because we really wanted to evaluate dogs in a more normal environment, and the best way to do that was in shelter dog play groups. So following Amy Sadler's Dog Playing for Life model, we evaluated all the dogs in the program in play groups, and they, they helped us see the dogs in an environment that was a bit more normal. 
especially, I think that poll question earlier, um, dogs that display sort of fear-based aggressive behaviors, for those dogs, playgroup was often the only thing that we needed to do because we saw a completely different side of those dogs once they went into playgroup. All the dogs in the study were evaluated with other dogs off-leash. We also did on-leash evaluations, but we didn't do them to sort of measure um, dog aggression or dog selectivity. We only used on-leash evaluations to look at leash reactivity. I can't remember, if you look at the dog in the bottom photo, I can't actually remember which one is the foster dog, but this was life for many of our foster dogs going home and hanging out with other uh, adopted permanent resident shelter dogs until they found their home. And as you can imagine, that photo at the bottom, we use that for marketing, that got that dog adopted. Whichever one of those isn't the own dog, that got that dog adopted right away. Um, when families can see that's how a dog is at home, they're so much faster to adopt them. And we would often take photos like that and stick them right on the kennels when the dogs didn't come back. People just need to know the dogs will normalize at home. Um, to be willing to take that leap of faith and, and bring that dog home. Okay, so we've come full circle to our study objectives. We wanted to know, could we place medium and large dogs with behavioral challenges in foster homes and see their behavior improving? Um, we believe that yes. The study shows um, with certainty that we did see their behavior improve when they went into foster homes. Uh, we wanted to know, could these dogs eventually be adopted into permanent homes? And yes, more than 90% of the dogs were adopted into permanent homes. And could we do all this safely? We found that, yes, we could do this in, in, as a program that was safe for both people and the animals involved. So moving on to the second part um, of this program, of this presentation, how do you do this yourself? Because it sounds great, right? But it's also a pretty big, it, it can also be a pretty big undertaking. And so I'm going to give you some tools tonight to just get started thinking about how you might run something like this at your shelter or rescue. First of all, you need program materials. And we have at the end, um, I've included a bunch of supplemental materials. So I think everything I'm referencing here um, is included as supplemental material. So feel free to uh, to use any of that for reference. Um, you need to have a training manual for your fosters that clearly lays out expectations. You need to have a written initial and signed foster agreement. We have one included in the supplemental documents that's now been um, vetted through several attorneys in two different cities. Um, so please feel free to um, review and use any of the language from that. You need resources for common behaviors uh, to help your fosters and your adopters quick one-page guide, and you need to have clearly written policies and procedures so that your fosters understand the criteria you're looking for, when they should bring a dog back, when they should contact you, et cetera. Um, the foster family should all receive signed copies of foster agreements for every dog. All medical and behavioral notes, the best thing we can do for fosters and adopt adopters is to arm them with as much information as we can. Uh, resources and tip sheets, 24-7 contact information for assistance anytime they need it and the foster feedback form. That's something that we forget a lot of the time, but that was a requirement for our fosters. They had to fill out that foster feedback form because that was what gave us the information that we would eventually need to save these dogs' lives. Remember, many of them came back to the shelter to be adopted, so that feedback form was really, really important. Um, that dog that's staring at you right now, that's Sweet Jane. I showed you a picture of her earlier. She was truly one of the most challenging dogs. She was afraid of men. She also had some fear-based aggressive behaviors, Primarily, she would just growl um, when she was nervous. That was her um, main behavior, but that was really unsettling for adopters. Sweet Jane was actually adopted by um, a, a couple, and the, the man um, who adopted her uh, is, was undergoing cancer treatment, and she has been his steadfast by his side companion as he's undergone treatment for cancer um, and has helped him tremendously through that really difficult period. So building capacity is one of the first things you need to do, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But one of the changes we made immediately, and I hope that everyone will do this, it, it's such a like, no-brainer. All of our volunteers became fosters, and all our volunteers our fosters became volunteers. So we just took our volunteers, and we said, now you're, you can foster too. And we took all our fosters and said, now you can volunteer too. 
we automatically double the capacity of each of those programs. So all of a sudden, if we had had 500 volunteers and 500 fosters, now we had 1,000 volunteers and 1,000 foster families. And the people most likely to foster your medium and large adult dogs are your volunteers. Those are the people that are connecting with them. They're coming into the shelter every day and they're connecting with those dogs already. We empower those people to take those dogs home and foster them. And we look for certain characteristics in behavioral foster families. I mentioned this in the beginning. Our foster families had to know the stakes. But what we found is that that's true for all of our fosters. So we, we really started to, as the program progressed, we stopped kind of like treating it as so special and different. And we, we really used the same criteria for all of our fosters because truly in even the most life-saving shelter in America, um, dogs and cats' lives are still at risk. And so we did, we did make that clear to all of our foster families. Um, that what they witnessed, what they observed in the home, that was information that we really needed to make determinations about those, those animals um, and their outcomes. We managed expectations and we communicated often. It's not enough to like wait to get called when there's a crisis. We were really proactive about our communication with fosters and adopters. Because animal lives are on the line, it was important that we were checking in every three days, every week at the most. We were checking in with our fosters just to make sure that things were going okay. I share this picture, and people always um, give me a hard time that I do, and they say, oh, no, you shouldn't be modeling that. And I certainly not intending, intending to model that, but that dog kissing that little boy is exactly what people do when they take home animals. And so we, we you know, we do our best to manage expectations. We do the best to stay, we can to stay in communication. And we try to offer, we try to offer ongoing training and support for people um, and <clears throat> give them all the tools they needed to be successful fosters and then adopters. We also provided avenues of support. So it wasn't just you took home a foster dog and you had to get it adopted. No, we made our program a community of people saving these dogs' lives. So our volunteers started a foster club um, and walking group uh, for foster families and adopters where they could get together and uh, work on behavioral challenges in a group setting, you know, especially for reactive dogs, this was invaluable. Um, we had free and low-cost training groups for our foster families, and this was done with our volunteer trainer support. We had a social media support group. We started, and this is another thing I, I w hope that all shelters will have, we had an internal, and we have one here in Austin as well, an internal group for staff, volunteers, and fosters. Um, it's a closed group. We had 600 members, um, and that group was there for constant, ongoing, 24-hour support, and it was so life-saving and so important, and it was so great that if you have a question, oh, my dog is doing this, or even, or, or if it's medical, my, my kitten is, um, you know, looking a little um, under the weather, you can just do a post in that page, and you'll get 10 people responding. And so we empowered our volunteers and fosters and our staff to be experts in supporting each other um, for the animals. And the other thing that social media support group was used for is that our fosters were expected to be posting pictures, video, stories throughout the animal foster experience. And then our social media, um, our communications person would pull that content and put that online and that would be used to market those animals. We had trainers support for troubleshooting. Um, we had a, a volunteer mentor for hard decisions that had to be made. If we did determine that we were going to use the a dog, that was always a really, really hard decision for us and for the foster. And so we had volunteer support to help um, support people through that. Um, we did home visits if needed to work on. Um, we sent trainers into homes to help work on any kind of home based, any kind of behaviors that were in the home, particularly for separation anxiety. Uh, we had a phone tree for emergencies, and we followed up with our adopters. So these are all avenues of support we had for fosters uh, and adopters uh, of these dogs. Okay, so uh, another poll question. Jesse, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kristen. It looks like we've reached our last poll question. Um, which of the following do you have at your shelter? Select all that apply. Social media group for volunteers, fosters, and staff free or low-cost training group, a foster club slash support system, a dog walking club for volunteers and fosters, 
a foster hotline, not applicable, or I don't know. Remember to answer on your screen and not in the Q&A box. It looks like we have our answers, Kristen. What do you think? Wow, 62% have a social media group for volunteers, foster, and staff. That is so awesome. That is great. I'm so happy to see that. For your low-cost training group, 21%. Foster club support system, dog walking club, 9.8%, and a foster hotline. Wow, that is really exciting about those social media groups. And those of you who have them know just how valuable they are. Um, it's a huge group of people helping the animals in your shelter um, through social media. So that's great. Cool. Okay. So number the other thing is track your data. Tracking data was so important because I think back now to when we did save these dogs and it would have been great and exciting to save 40, 47 out of 52 dogs. That would have been felt like an accomplishment, and we would have been really proud of that. But because we just kept a simple Excel spreadsheet and tracks, we're not research scientists, and you know, I, I we called this a study initially. It was really a pilot project, but because we tracked our data, the impact that those 52 dogs and the 47 live outcomes will have now and in the future is so much higher. Those dogs will now do the work of saving so many other dogs just simply because we track data. That part's really important. And in your supplemental document, um, I included the Excel spreadsheet that we use to track our data. Uh, we provided resources. If any of you are not familiar with this, you should be the Center for Shelter Dogs um, now um, through Tufts University um, has a an excellent resource for common behavioral challenges um, under special adoptions. And you can kind of see this. There's, it's a bunch of PDFs. There are these one-pagers that are so great to give to your fosters and adopters that just tell you how to deal with some kind of, kind of common behaviors like jumpy mouthy, fear of people, things like that. So we print those out and give those um, as, as appropriate with all of our fosters and adopters now. Okay. so. This is Hank, and I called him Bully. His name in the shelter is Bully. His name is Hank now. And he's the one that I showed you in the beginning um, in his foster home. So I'm going to tell you his story now. Uh, he was, m in all of my time in animal welfare, the saddest um, I think I've ever been to see a dog come into the shelter. His owner was also um, homeless, and they, he and Bully um, had been living in a truck. But the police started to um, get called on him just because he was living in his truck and people would see the dog um, with him and call the police. And so he had to surrender Bully. And the day that he surrendered him, they, the two of them, he laid on the floor with Bully, and the two of them just laid there crying, both of them, both dog and human. And it was, um, again, like the saddest thing I've seen happen in um, any shelter I've worked in. It was heartbreaking. Well, we took Bully back um, to the kennel, and for the next two weeks he was, he laid in his kennel, truly heartbroken. He cried. He sounded like a person when he cried. Um, and he he would um, growl. Anytime anybody came up to the kennel, he would just lay in the back and growl at them. And he was one of those dogs that, like, if someone hadn't really noticed, he could have easily slipped through the cracks and been one of those dogs that died for this, quote, unquote, fear-based aggression or unhandleable or any of these categories we use. Um, but we... We worked with him. Our volunteers really patiently sat by his kennel and eventually got him out. And we sent him to one of our really special foster families where he got to go live on a farm uh, with a little boy. And he kind of came back to life through that experience. And over the couple weeks that he was there, we saw him kind of return to, like, get over his heartbreak. And we saw that smile come back on his face. Um, he was able to be adopted. Uh, by uh, a couple who are absolutely head over heels in love with him. And his Hank's dad, who is in, you can see his head in this middle picture, he, he sent us this quotation. He said, Hank is a once-in-a-lifetime dog. We have such a connection. He's the best thing that's happened to me in the last 20 years. And he's so smart. When you tell him we're going on a walk, he goes and gets his leash. He's not like a dog. He's like a human. And I don't know what I'd do without this dog. He sleeps with his arms around me, and he snores so loudly. 
Hank, um, that this particular family hunts children and grandchildren, and Hank loves kids, so he's always around the kids. Um, and he is he's a beloved companion uh, to his owners. Um, and he's another dog that we see we keep coming across in this study when we looked at the dogs. Dogs that like it wasn't just that the people saved the dogs. The dogs ended up really saving the people and giving back just as much to those humans that saved them as those humans gave to them. When we when we talk about the dogs, we think about like how worthwhile their lives are. Um, we didn't just save them. They're, they're, some of them are just like beloved pets, but others of them are, are doing meaningful work in the world. There's one dog who I don't have a picture of who is actually a therapy dog um, for uh, depressed teenagers. He works at a school, and um, his owner is the uh, guidance counselor at the school, and so he sits in her office all day, and when kids come to speak with her, he just comforts them. Is another example of a dog who's like living a really meaningful, full life, helping people. People always wonder, how are you going to find behavioral fosters? Like, how are you going to find people that want to take these dogs? Okay, number one, start with your volunteers. Let them start to foster the dogs. They're the ones that are already connected with them. But another lesson that is really important that came out of this work in Virginia is that you just need one person. And that this is our one person here. I keep saying as I'm talking tonight, we, we, we. Well, I'm actually talking about myself um, and Kelly, who's pictured here. And Kelly typically presents with me. Kelly was the first person to start taking dogs home um, that were identified as dogs with behavioral challenges. And what started happening is that Kelly would take the dogs home for a couple of days, and she would post pictures and videos. And then suddenly other people were like, you know, I think I could take that dog. I think I could do this. And it started a kind of snowball effect where because of that group um, social media page, other people started to jump in. And Kelly provided the example, and she showed that, that this could be done, and she showed how um, different the dogs were in homes. And suddenly we didn't just have one of her. We had 15. If you're watching, Kelly, thank you. You're amazing. Okay, I'm going to tell you a couple more quick stories. I'm going to try to finish up because I know people have questions. Um, this is Kane. Those of you who work in shelters will be very familiar with this. Um, Kane, this is Kane in his kennel, I, and you've probably seen this dog walking by a million times. The staff observations, I had to put him directly into his kennel. He lowers his head. I'm unable to evaluate him. Another one, growling at me during walkthrough when I stopped to interact with him. Um, and a third observation, he was fearful and stayed towards the back of the kennel, low growling. This dog could have easily died um, in many shelters. So... Here's Kane in his foster home, and you can see the difference. This is a, a day into being in foster. You can see the, him in the kennel, and then you can see him in his foster home uh, with his uh, foster brother, Sue, on the left, um, waiting for a treat. And then you can see Kane with his family. Um, his adopters are so happy that we saved his life. Um, they sent us this Christmas card last year um, thanking us, and there's there's Kane with his family. Um, and they, this family is so happy that we thought that Kane's life was worth saving and that our foster families and volunteers work together to save it. And this is another way people don't often think of the program as doing this, but because we communicate open and honestly with our adopters just as much as our fosters, we also engage our adopters into telling them the stories of these dogs and where they've been and what their experience was in foster and how these just volunteers and foster families work together to save the dogs. And our adopters really appreciate the transparency and the honesty, but they also love sharing the dog stories. We provided adopter support, um, and Kelly this, Kelly talks about how we really just, um, our fosters often provided our post-adoption support. Um, they were there at the other end of the phone. They were there for the families to call if they had questions. Um, and the foster families would often show the adopters how to be successful and help them find solutions to common problems. In the end, what was born out of this little foster study for um, the community in Fairfax was a really comprehensive program to save dogs. Out of this, out of these few dogs that went to foster, we 
they've developed this um, walking group. And this, this is a picture of the group here. Some of these dogs are adopted. Some of these dogs are fosters. And some of these are just shelter dogs that are out for a walk um, with people who decided to get them out for a shelter break. And this is called the rescue crew. This is, these are just a few of the people um, who are part, being part of the solution to save more medium and large adult dogs um, in, in the county. And these programs all built upon one another. As soon as we started to empower fosters and volunteers to uh, save dogs in one way, they started to brainstorm new ways um, to save more dogs and to uh, create more programs to support that life saving. And I'm excited to say that in 2015, 40% uh, of the dogs, um, the available adoptable dogs in the shelter went to foster at least once. Um, and that could be for a day outing or an overnight outing um, or longer term. And 40% isn't high enough. It's really just the beginning. Uh, foster, and, and in most shelters, this number wouldn't be nearly this high, but it should be. Every time we get them out is another chance to save their lives. Sometimes it only takes an hour. And if you remember um, Patty's story, the dog that kind of started the study, it was just one paw stepping out of the shelter that saved that dog's life. So as we've done this study, and we've, we've done similar work, we're doing similar work here in Austin, uh, we've thought a lot about what, what is next for this type of work. Um, and we have three kind of ideas about that. One is that we imagine and envision a reallocation of staff and other resources towards foster-based rather than shelter-based solutions. Every animal shelter needs to have a foster coordinator. Um, foster needs to be at the very top um, of the priority list when it comes to staffing because that person is responsible, is able to get animals out that if they stay in the shelter will likely die in the shelter. And also imagining a revision, we imagine a revisioning of the role of foster programs in the larger animal welfare movement so that foster isn't a program of the periphery. It's not a program just for puppies and kittens, which we still see in so many shelters or sick animals. It's a program that's accessible to all of the animals in our shelter that need to get out in order to have their lives saved. And we also see foster as one of several solutions to end the practice of killing fearful, traumatized, and anxious animals because of shelter-based behavior. This is kind of a, this, this foster program isn't really revolutionary, and it probably should have happened a long time ago. We should have started, and, and certainly it probably has been happening in some communities for a long time, but we should have and could have been doing this a long time ago to save more dogs. And so, we're really behind the times. Um, this is just an expectation of where we're at um, for life saving for our animals. And so we see it much less as revolutionary or particularly exciting and more as something that just like dog play groups, just like kennel enrichment, should be a standard for animal shelters. I want to just talk about a couple of um, takeaways uh, because as we, as, as I close up, um, I think that the first one is that these programs, like play groups, fostering, these are proven ways to save lives of medium and large adult dogs. Um, and that these programs are really key to protecting the safety of people and animals in our community. Um, and that this foster-based program is simply a recognition that in the midst of like, the trauma of empowerment and confinement and unfamiliarity, that we may not have the ability in a shelter to really know anything at all about the dogs in our care. And that at this moment in animal welfare, in this moment of achieving um, record life-saving rates, we're saving so many animals, we have a responsibility to do more than look at a traumatized terrified animal in our shelter and make a life and death determination without doing as much due diligence as we possibly can to find out what that animal will be like outside of the shelter environment, to find out that animal's story. We owe our animals, we owe our dogs more at this point, and foster is a free, easy, safe way to get that information to save more medium and large adult dogs in our shelters.
as you think, as I sort of in closing, as you think about that dog that is laying at your feet or on your bed or waiting for you at home right now, I I think that for those of us working in animal welfare, it's my hope that we can put as much care and effort and rigor into making these life and death decisions for the dogs in our shelters as we would for those dogs in our homes. And that this program is a way to do that. It's a way to treat every dog as if it's just as important as those ones that we love as our companions and our friends and our and our pets. So I will turn it over to Jesse now um, for any questions that, that you have. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, Right before we start into the questions, which we do have a few minutes for, um, I just want to remind everybody that if you're interested in learning more about this program or in implementing this pro program, please put your contact information into the Q&A box, and we'll make sure that that contact information gets to Kristen. Okay, so let's go on to the first question. So our first question is, our biggest challenge is placing dogs who, based on behavior in the shelter, cannot be placed with other dogs. These dogs stay with us for months to years, and we have a challenge finding somewhere to place them. Did you place similar dogs? If yes, how? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we did, uh, and the, the, we, got, we gained the information about um, if those dogs were actually dog aggressive. Um, are unable to safely interact with other dogs, we gain that information in playgroups. So um, I would first wonder um, if, if you're doing playgroups and how you're making that determination if that the dog cannot be placed with other dogs. Um, we see over and over again shelters that aren't doing playgroups or aren't allowing dogs to interact off leash, uh, making that determination, and then um, we don't really know that information. So that would be the, the, first, um, the first thing I would say is that to ensure that all those dogs are being evaluated off leash with other dogs. Um, and again, Amy Sadler's Dog Playing for Life has a safe, proven protocol for that. Um, and yeah, we certainly did. And yes, those dogs, um, dogs that are not social with other dogs can be some of the most challenging and take longer to find homes for. Um, here in Austin, we last year saved um, a raw 96% of the animals, um, of the 18,000 animals that came into the shelter last year. Um, and many of those were dogs that were not social with other dogs, and they do require um, a special effort. And if those dogs are a challenge in your community, um, that's where you can assemble a volunteer team to problem solve that particular problem through marketing um, and through identifying possible placements for those dogs. But yeah, that's certainly a challenge that we still face even here in Austin. Thank you, Kristen. We're going to move on to our next question. Do you feel 30 days is enough time to determine proper placement? Uh, I think it depends on the individual dog. Uh, yes, in general, um, and we we often didn't even need that much time because the, so many of the dogs just went to homes and like normalized. So they like got out of the shelter and they were just like a normal, regular, just like all the dogs that we um, place in home. So I think it depends. For some dogs, it might be a bit longer. But in general, yeah, I think that 30 days is a, um, is enough, is more than enough time for many dogs to determine proper placement. We also have very, very open return policies. We want people to bring dogs back to us if they're truly not working, but we also are going to do everything we can to provide um, support, resources, and education so that they can keep that dog, and that's through that aggressive post-adoption follow-up program. Great. Thank you, Kristen. Um, let's go on to our next question. We still have a few more. Um, did you run into any insurance and liability challenges in putting at-risk dogs into foster? How do you manage and mitigate the risk of putting fear-aggressive and resource-guarding dogs in foster? Is there a level of these behaviors you allow slash not allow? Uh, yeah, this is a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, so it, first thing I'll say is that in, in moving forward, we probably won't even call this. As we move forward with the program, I don't know that we'll call this um, a behavioral foster program because it really isn't that. It's dogs that are having trouble in the shelter environment. Um, and so when we think about, like, dogs with more serious problems, um, dogs that might have 
problems that would um, make their behavior risky. Here in Austin, we have Austin Pets Alive, and they have a very advanced, sophisticated behavioral rehabilitation program. So we're really lucky here that we can take those dogs, they can go to Austin Pets Alive and get behavioral rehabilitation. Part of It's a key part of how we're saving so many lives here. Um, and we remember in uh, Fairfax, we were saving up to 90% of the dogs um, at the, the highest point of the study. So we really weren't, the dogs in the study weren't, um, there weren't any significant aggression issues uh, for these dogs. So um, we weren't, we didn't see, we didn't see evidence of any um, additional uh, risk. Um, and, and this liability word comes up a lot. If you go to, when you go to the supplemental documents and you see the um, foster contract we use, um, that has been vetted through um, several different attorneys and um, it, it really just spells out, it clearly spells out the expectations um, and the circumstances of the foster agreement and so we use that for all of our fosters. Um, and yes, there were levels of behaviors we did and did not allow and we did have lines in the sand and um, those were different in Fairfax um, where we were saving 90% than they are here in Austin. Um, and, and I would say that the longer that we do these programs, uh, we can't emphasize enough the importance of considering every situation individually. So while we did have some definite lines of the sand, in terms of harm caused to a person um, in particular, we, we look at every situation and circumstances individually to determine the best outcome um, for that dog. And that means everything from calling back um, the previous owner um, to uh, as much different kinds of um, assessment and evaluation as we can do in the shelter to play group. Um, so we, we do our due diligence to learn as much as we can. We think of ourselves like dog detectives when we're trying to determine individual outcomes. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, let's move on to our next question. What type of training did you offer the foster families prior to taking home dogs? Oh, okay, that's a great question, yes. So we provide the same basic training to all of our foster families um, of dogs. And so as we combine the foster and volunteer programs, we actually provide the same basic foundational training um, to fosters and volunteers. And all of our training was um, positive focus. Um, and we, for the, the foster families that took home the more behaviorally challenged dogs, we provided them individual training for those dogs. So what it, depending on what the issue was, we um, gave them um, training and ongoing support for that particular issue. Um, so it just depended on kind of the issue that they were uh, facing. And we, the training that we provided to the fosters throughout was positive focused training um, and also, they, um, they had troubleshooting. So we had volunteer trainers who would go into their home or provide consult um, through the process. These are some great questions. We still have time for a few more. These are great questions, yeah. Yeah. Hold on just a second. We'll bring it up. Just one more second, everybody. We'll get the next question up. Here we go. How do you find slash recruit fosters who are capable of dealing with some of these behavioral challenges? Yes, so I, I mentioned a couple of things um, that I'll go back through really quickly and then add, um, add a couple more. Um, first, obviously, we used our volunteer core. If we had 500 volunteers working with the dogs, those volunteers are the most likely to see those dogs and want to help them. So we used our existing resources. We weren't out, you know, we weren't on social media saying, hey, we need fosters for these behaviorally challenged dogs. We were using our internal resources first. Um, and then we were also having those people were acting as marketing and assistance to help um, recruit more. So uh, seeing them be successful, seeing the transition of the dog from their kennel behavior to their home behavior and, and sharing that with our volunteers and fosters was all the recruitment we needed. We didn't need, the other thing that we talk about, I talk a lot about, is that we don't, you don't need special people. 
you need people with some like basic general dog handling skills, people who can walk a strong dog, but you don't really need people with any kind of special skill set. You need people that care about the dogs, that are upfront and honest, that communicate with you regularly, um, and understand the, the stakes of what they're doing. Um, so we, we didn't have an issue with recruitment. Uh, and I think that as we, as we develop this program further and we think about doing external recruitment, we're going to think a lot about um, how to engage new fosters through very short-term uh, fostering. There's a program we did called uh, Field Trips. And this was something we let brand new volunteers come in and take back on field trips. And through that experience, we recruited people, um, and we usually start them out with an older dog, um, and then maybe move to a younger, more exuberant dog. But those um, people who like to take the dogs out on field trips, those are the kinds of people that we'll be looking to recruit, recruit, recruit eventually for dogs that really need a kennel break. Um, and, and as we move forward, we're really going to think of this as a, as a program to get, simply get dogs who need to get out of the shelter a life-saving break from the shelter. Um, that's really what this has evolved into. Great, thank you. We still have about four minutes left, so here's our next question. We have a strong but very small group of foster families, pets that need only a five to six week foster placement to ensure rescue get euthanized because we can't find fosters. How do we increase the number of foster families and educate the community? Um, okay, this is a great question because I think we put a lot of barriers in fostering. So here in Austin, it's not any harder to foster a dog than it is to adopt one. We say that and people are like, what? We actually have the same application for fosters as we do for adopters. When we talk to people about foster programs, we find there are so many barriers in place. You have to fill out an application and then wait a month and then maybe get called for a training and then come in and then do some more sessions. Um, based on what kind of animal you want to foster. And then the foster coordinator pairs you up with an animal they think that you'd be the best suited to. We removed those barriers. Um, here in Austin, one of the programs we have, because we have periodic base crises based on um, seasonal problems and uh, weather emergencies, we started this emergency foster program. And we, we, we were, had um, a flood. We had 50 dogs in crates. And we, we said to the community, like, please, we need your help. And the community all came out. And we signed up 50 new fosters that day. They took home 50 of our regular old shelter dogs out of the shelter. They provided short-term foster. And that was a really important lesson for us because it, it allowed us to start to strip away some of those barriers to people initially becoming fosters to grow the program much more quickly um, so that we just had a larger pool. So I would say that that's the most – we get this question a lot, and it's the most common thing is that we, we need to make it easier and faster for people to start fostering animals in general in our shelters. Because when we put barriers in place, every day it takes longer for a new foster family to come on board is another animal dying in your shelter because it couldn't get the foster. Thank you, Kristen. It looks like we'll have time for just one more question. How do you convince staff that dogs can still be safe in a different environment? Sure. Uh, some of the biggest pushback um, people get and, and people tell us about it from their own staff. This is a different way of doing things, um, and it's, a, it's an evolution in our movement. Animal welfare is evolving extremely rapidly. Um, in the 19th, I was just reading the other day that in the um, 1970s, and national animal welfare leaders were saying we can see 40% of the animals, and uh, in the 90s, it was 60, and then 70%, and then uh, with no kill, uh, initially it became 90%, and now we're setting the bar even higher uh, for life saving. But in that increase in life saving, we're also building up new progressive programs. And just like saving barn cats or um, through TNR programs or through uh, saving puppies with parvo, this is the same kind of program. It's targeting a group of animals in the shelter that's dying and developing life-saving programs. And it's through your, your staff members seeing the successes of some of these dogs that you'll change their mind. So I go back to Kelly, um, who was our first um, brave foster mom uh, who took home a medium and large dog with behavioral challenge. She was able to show so many staff and volunteers um, that it could be done, it could be done safely, and that we could save that dog's life through doing it. 
Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, and that will be the end of our event tonight. Again, thank you, Kristen, and all of you for your time tonight. Uh, Maddie's Fund supports initiatives and programs that save more pet lives, including foster care programs. We believe proper training and management for both staff, volunteers, and the pets in their care are core to these programs. Be sure to join us on October 13th for our next webcast, Innovating Your Volunteer Program. More information on this webcast will be arriving in your inbox soon. This webcast will be available on demand shortly, and we hope you will share this presentation on your social sites. Thanks again for being here with us this evening, and good night.